Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission for March 23rd, 2022. Um, may I have the roll call, please? Chair McGill. Here. Vice Chair Clark. Here. Commissioner Aldana. Present. Commissioner Feck. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton. Commissioner Longstreet. Here. Commissioner Anandir LaBerge. Uh, here, <laughs> present. And um, Chair Clark, we understand that Commissioner Lesnar Buxton will be joining us later. Yes, that's my understanding as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on to general business. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Chair McGill, no, we do not. Okay, thank you. Um, I have not seen any written communications. Do we have any written communications? No, we do not have written communications. Okay, thank you. Um, that brings us to public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. The total amount of time for public comments will be 15 minutes. Um, Ms. Navarez, do you see any raised hands? I'll have to read my little thing here. Sure. For those who wish to speak during public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality in the Zoom control panel. We are currently displaying a graphic with instructions. When I call on you, please unmute yourself and then speak for a maximum of two minutes. If you are having technical difficulties, please use the Q&A function to let staff know. Only questions pertaining to technical issues will be addressed. For those who wish to speak on an agenda item later in the meeting, please raise your hand when the item is under discussion. And I need a minute here because it's been a while for me to do this and I'm forgetting how to do this. Wow, your hand is raising. I know, and we don't want that. <laughs> There's a little thing I have to click and it's, um, hold on a second. This is terrible. I should have done this ahead of time. Oh my goodness. Give me a minute, I'm so sorry. Sure, no problem. I am so sorry. My goodness. Uh, thankfully, this should be our last one doing it this way. <laughs> okay, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, and that brings us to the Youth Council report. Do we have one this month? Uh, no, we do not. Okay, I didn't think so. All righty, then we are on to Commissioner Committee assignment reports. Um, I will go in the order that I see you on my screen. So that means um, I will be starting with Commissioner Longstreet. Um, this month I attended the De La Guerra um, Plaza uh, Surface Subcommittee. Um, the subcommittee is looking at um, the materials to be used in De La Guerra Plaza to make them flow best from um, from City Hall and from the historic uh, Adobe and so it's an interesting one and we'll be meeting again on the 29th. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Clark. 
Um, hi, I was unable to attend the stack meeting this month, but I did spend two and a half hours this morning watching the video. So I'll be able to um, represent stack adequately today. I did attend uh, the community planting that the Santa Barbara Creeks department sponsored at the Royal Burn open space on March 12th. There was a fantastic turnout of community members from eight year olds up to 80 year olds. It was really nice to see people out there um, helping get that space together with native uh, vegetation. And then today I attended the Park Foundation meeting. We reviewed financials. We discussed the Plaza Del Mar van shell renovation, the funding and grants awarded so far and future um, fundraising possibilities. Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Anander Laberge. Thank you. I attended uh, the art show uh, meeting for the month and they did add three new artists, which is exciting. So we, we're, I think, at a total of now eight, I believe, new artists um, uh, since February. And they are, again, print and, uh, and paint. I'm hoping that they might add some jewelers in the future, but it seems that the, the people who are most interested right now are just kind of doing uh, paintings um, or prints. And so they spent a lot of their time also continuing to talk about the minimum number of hours that the artists should be there uh, in their spaces to be able to receive the credits that they have to have to, to run, retain their, their spots, or I guess their seniority. Um, and it's an interesting focus of what accommodates them best, uh, sort of forgetting that there are people from the public who also would like to enjoy the show and would probably like to see the artists there at least a certain number of hours before they start moving and uh, wrapping their things up. So I'm hoping that they can find that good balance between what fits for them and what fits for their target audience. Um, but that was the, the gist of their meeting for this month. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. It's actually, it's great to see new artists um, wanting to participate. Um, it is. It's very exciting. We've got a whole bunch between um, people who are just starting to discover that they are an artist and they're wanting to sort of test the waters and see if their art sells and others who have been doing it for years but have just kind of discovered the show um so it's a pretty exciting mix of people that they're bringing in oh good 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 yeah wonderful um okay commissioner aldana uh yes re regarding parks and rec um, i attended the meeting um parks and rec sponsored at the um, yellow gardens um it was to give an update um, on the fence line and the situation there at the uh, at the gardens. So it was um, plenty of gardeners there and it, it was well attended. And uh, I was uh, very satisfied with what Parks and Rec um, had to say. And it seems to me that they're, they're being fair and coming up with a happy medium. and. I think after all said and done, it, it'll be uh, it'll be good. It'll be good for the gardeners, you know, the farmers, uh, along with uh, the community with the the park remodel. Right. Well, it's good to see this progressing well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, I also attended the Park Foundation meeting this afternoon. Um, and the only thing I have to add to what Vice Chair Clark said is that the uh, band shell funding is getting tantalizingly close. So there needs to be one final push to get us over the edge so that uh, it can go forward. Um, and then I attended the ribbon cutting for the Arroyo Borough open area, which was, as you see in the director's report, really well attended and a lot of fun. And the place is really, really beautiful. So I can recommend checking it out. And that, I think that finishes assignment reports. So moving on to commission and staff communications. Um, do we have anything this month? Chair McGill and commissioners, um, I think uh, you are all aware that we will be returning into in-person meetings with our April meeting. Um, which I believe is the 23rd or the, oh, the 27th at four o'clock in city council chamber. Since we have some commissioners that haven't had the opportunity to uh, sit on the commission at the city council chamber, 
recommend that you arrive a little bit early to get your tutorial. Uh, we are very excited about this. Um, it's been a long two years for everyone. And since this is our last um, virtual meeting, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the administration staff of the department that have hosted meetings for the last two years, including Rose Navarra's or supported meetings, Caitlin Lamb, Patty Herrera, Jen Hollywood, Liz Smith, Daisy Hernandez. And I may be missing someone, um, but it's, um, it's been a, a big lift and they've really ensured that we've been able to continue to conduct public meetings despite the pandemic. Thank you. And boy, I sure would like to second that. These, these meetings have not been easy and, um, and I, it, they've been, you know, as seamless as they possibly could have been given the circumstances. And I think, you know, a great job to everybody involved. So thank you. Um, while we're on that sort of general topic, um, it's in the agenda, but just to make sure that everybody hears it, um, there will be a change to the, the due date for written communications. It has been up through this month, I think at three o'clock the day of the meeting, it's now being moved 24 hours. So it's actually 24 hours before the meeting that any written communications will be due starting next month, which should give people more time to read and digest. Okay. I believe that's it for general business. So moving on to ceremonial items, do we have um, any one we would like to celebrate this month? Chair McGill and commissioners, we did not have anyone that was recognized for their years of service at the city council this month. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then summary of council actions um, that's been included in our packet. And do we have, um, any comments or questions from anyone? I'm taking silence as a no. And so that means we will move on to approval of the minutes from the February 23rd meeting and the recommendation being that the commission waive the reading and approve the minutes of the regular meeting of February 23rd, 2022. Is there any discussion or a motion? Uh, Commissioner Longstreet, if you were speaking, oh, I did not hear you. So moved. Did you hear me? I heard the second half. Yeah, so moved. Okay, I moved. Thank you. Okay. Nicole, uh, Vice Chair Clark. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, thanks. I saw the raised hand. All right. Um, comments? If no comments, we have a motion and a second. Could we take get a vote, please? Chair McGill. Aye. Vice Chair Clark. Aye. Commissioner Aldana. Aye. Commissioner Longstreet. Aye. Commissioner Unander Laberge. Aye. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, and so then that takes us to the tree. So we have uh, Superintendent Slack. Good afternoon, Chair McGill and Commissioners. The first Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review is a request to remove a Mexican fan palm. Um, this is technically a city street tree located within Stork Placida, um, adjacent to the address at 64 East De La Guerra Plaza. Also, 726 State Street is kind of the, the address for the actual parcel. Um, the applicant is requesting the removal of the palm tree due to concerns with damage to the corner of their building. If you were able to perform a site visit, it was pretty apparent the root system from the palm has essentially enveloped uh, the lower portion of that corner. The applicant uh, expressed uh, concerns with moisture being trapped between the root mass and the building leading to water damage. And I think there, there was also concern with just the pressure of the roots as well. But the, the primary focus of our discussion at, at the committee level revolved around water retention as a result of that root growth. The committee reviewed uh, the application 
uh, in discussing just the palm in general was noted to be in good health, um, well maintained. Extensive discussion occurred regarding the situation, which was quite unique. Um, the to sort of segue into the, the the root of the issue, no pun intended. The um, focus with the committee's review had to do with the palm trees root system. Palms are monocots, not dicots, like when we think of shade trees. So the root system, the stems, all plant parts never get larger in diameter. So what we call secondary growth. And that was the primary rationale from the committee in terms of the recommendation that we'll get to here in a second. So the palm roots grow out and they, they continue to increase in length and extend out into the soil as far as possible. But again, they never increase in, in, in diameter. That increase in diameter that occurs in shade trees and other woody plants, that is commonly what we see that affects hardscapes. So when we see raised sidewalks, it has a lot less to do with just the root itself and, and much more to do with the increase in the diameter over time. And, and so again, palm tree species do not produce secondary growth. Probability of hardscape disruption with most palm trees is, is exceptionally low. I would, I would also caution to never say never. There are isolated incidents where palms have caused disruption, so it's not like it, it's impossible. It can happen, but it is at a very low probability. So when the committee was looking at the specific tree in this situation, it was their opinion and consensus amongst the group that there was a lack of substantial evidence that actually showed that there was damage to the structure. During review, we had lots of discussion back and forth with uh, both of the applicants and they, they were of the opinion that it was very difficult to illustrate damage when the roots were enveloping the building, which is a very good point. Uh, the moisture argument was evaluated at great length as well. Uh, it's not raining, so there's really not lots of moisture um, to be trapped against the building. Um, again, lots of discussion back and forth, uh, sort of Q&A between the committee and the uh, applicants. We spent nearly an hour discussing this uh, specific request. And ultimately, after review, um, the committee made a recommendation to deny the removal without prejudice to allow the applicant to return at some point in time in the future um, if they desired to provide additional information to illustrate that there was in fact damage being caused by the root system of the Mexican fan palm adjacent to the building. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions for Mr. Slack? If not, I, I guess I do have one. I mean, in reading this, I saw their primary concern, the, the water trapping and basically, I guess, you know, um, corrosion, I don't know, I'm not, not, don't have the right word, of the uh, building itself as being quite almost separate from the root structure. It's, it's really a proximity of almost any part of the tree and not necessarily the fact that it's the roots, it's the actual proximity. Was there any discussion of what it would take to demonstrate that this is actually impacting the building? I mean, how, how could they prove it? Because it is really close. And Chair McGill and commissioners, I think that that uh, gets right at the root of the problem. Yeah. Um, the, the root system being enveloped or enveloping the building pre pre essentially prevents lots of exploratory work in terms of being able to explore Ex, um, open up the area to be able to illustrate the damage. So it is, it's a very difficult situation. That's why we spent so much time um, during the review and having lots of discussion back, you know, between the, the applicants and also the committee. Um, I think it's a, we, there was some conversation about bringing in a palm expert. Um, they, the applicant <clears throat> also brought in sort of a, a structural expert who did provide a letter that was in the app, app, uh, in addition to the application explaining his concerns from sort of a structural engineer's perspective with roots being close to the building. I did talk to the, the palm expert in advance of this meeting and 
he was of a similar opinion to the committee. Um, he was, he's in LA, was unable to, to come up and actually take a look at the tree. We discussed also at the, at the committee meeting that I think there's always going to be a fundamental divide between sort of the structural engineer and the, the, the plant expert in terms of what, whether there really is a problem or not. And so I think it's a, it's a very complicated situation. And evaluating it further post committee meeting, I think that you could potentially shave the roots away from the building, at least above ground. And that would alleviate, alleviate a significant amount of the, the root mass that's covering the building. Uh, I think that even if you were to cut the palm tree down, as they indicated they, they would like to do, the root system's going to persist for you know many, many years before it would actually decompose to the point where it was not touching the building below the soil surface. So, so that was actually my next question. Could you actually shave part of it away to a, either um, help mitigate it, but also to further evaluate the prop, the uh, issue, potential issue? Chair McGill and commissioners, you could. I think it would be very challenging. I think as you got down towards the soil surface level, it would become increasingly difficult. But I do think that uh, moving forward, there are options available to, to open up a little bit of the, there's a little gap that we could create between the, the root ball, um, essentially the stem of the palm and the building. Um, moving below the soil line would be difficult with the palm uh, yeah. still in place though. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, Commissioner Aldana. Uh, yes, uh, so there is no foundation problems in the, the doors to the right of it. They open and close properly. Chair McGill and Commissioner Aldana, <clears throat> there was no information provided by the applicant. Uh, showing any any foundation damage, any cracking, no interior photos that that illustrated any damage. The doors uh, do function. The doors sit a little lower than the sidewalk grade, and there was there they do get water infiltration there. Um, I think that some of that is just a grade issue. There is a little bit of probably sloughing off of, of rainwater uh, as a result of that sort of tapered root zone there um, that goes through the door. But again, no uh, photographic evidence that spoke to any damage, um, any visible damage on the site. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, not seeing any. Oh, uh, Vice Chair Clark, you're muted. Um. I have more comments to make, so I guess I suppose we should wait. To talk yeah, let's hold off and see if until um, hold off any comments until after we see if there's anyone from the public. Okay, with that, um, Ms. Navarez, do we have anyone from the public wishing to speak? Anyone who would like to speak on <clears throat> speak on this item, please raise your hand in the Zoom control panel. And there are no hands raised. And Okay, so with that, I uh, will entertain comments and or a motion. And now we'll go to Vice Chair Clark. Um, so I just I just wanted to briefly um, give my perspective of what I believe Stack's perspective on this tree was. It's not necessarily so much, it's, it's not just about the tree in this um, situation, it's more about due diligence and evidence and setting precedent. Um, we have seen this tree before, it came before us and we denied the removal without prejudice because the stack and the commission members wanted to see evidence that this tree was causing damage and water intrusion, damage to the building itself. And essentially we got just a repeat of the same application with a letter from an engineer that said it's causing damage. So, I mean, if you look at this like a court case, it's innocent until proven guilty. We just can't pass a sentence on the tree without seeing some kind of evidence. Um, and what made this situation so hard is because what Nate, Dr. Mr. Slack was saying, the nature of the crowding of the building by the tree, it's really, really hard to produce evidence. Um, I don't know if we talked today about there being a gap where we could actually get in there and look that, I don't know if I, buzzed out for that part of the meeting, but um, I, I like the idea of 
that um, the staff wasn't against removing the tree if there was evidence to the fact that there was indeed damage. That's all I want to say. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or a motion? Uh, Commissioner Longstreet. Um, I would make a motion to concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee denial of the removal of the um, Mexican fan palm at 624 East De La Guerra Plaza uh, without prejudice. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any um additional comments I mean I guess the only comment I would have is I would hope the uh, we the um, tree department could be could work with the applicant to see if there is a way to do a little exploratory work on that but other than that I I'm just, that's the only comment I have to make all right fair than that we have a motion and a second can we have a vote please uh, chair McGill Aye. Vice Chair Clark. Aye. Commissioner Aldana. Aye. I see Commissioner Lazar Buxton just arrived, but um, since he did not hear this item, I will not call on him. So Commissioner Longstreet. Aye. Commissioner Anandera Laberge. Aye. All right, so moved. Moving on to, I believe it's 398 Wyola. Chair McGill and commissioners, the next street tree advisory committee recommendation for review is a request to remove the jacaranda, which is a street tree uh, located in front of the property at 398 Wyola Road. The applicant was requesting removal of the tree due to concerns with the slab foundation of the home as well as plumbing. It's worth noting that in this specific instance, it is not sewer. When we refer to plumbing, it was purely a water service issue. The sewer drains to the back of the home. The committee reviewed the application, noted the tree was in good health, well maintained. Uh, the applicant was present. There was some discussion between the committee and the applicant regarding, in a very similar manner to the previous item, um, evidence that spoke to damage. Um, essentially, the applicant was unable to provide any evidence that there was any damage to the property. Um, and or the water service uh, plumbing as indicated on the application there were surface roots present in the yard uh, but again uh, it, during discussion no evidence was able to be provided by the applicant um, ultimately after review the committee uh, made a recommendation to deny the request for removal of the jacaranda at 398 Wyola road Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Slack? I do not. If I could clarify quickly, my apologies. It was a denial without prejudice in a similar manner to the previous item to allow them to come back in the future um, with evidence of the damage. Okay, okay thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Vice Chair Clark, your hand went up and then it went down. Is it up? It's up. It's up. Um, I was just wondering if Mr. Slack could very briefly speak to you um, for the newer commissioners, whether or not tree roots cause damage to pipes or whether they just seek out a uh, failure that's already happened. Chair McGill and commissioners, it's in certain situations, I think when we look at sewer laterals, it's widely accepted and understood on a, on a national level that there's always some previous failure. Uh, that failure could be as simple as the construction materials used, uh, you know, 60, 70 years ago when pipes literally set within one another. Um, they can, in some instances, cause disruptions to water services. We, unfortunately, every once in a while, a tree will have been planted too close to a water service. And as a result of just root system expansion, it can create pressure on a water line and it, and it can cause a leak. Those are pretty few and far between, um, and they're usually uh, isolated to incidents where trees, you know, are in close proximity to a water meter. As we move further and further away from the tree, 
the sort of the base of the tree, that probability of uh, root related issue decreases significantly. Um, in a case where you have a sealed pipe, such as a water pipe, you literally need to have root in contact with that pipe and over time pressure to, to sort of displace that. You know, as, as wonderful as trees are, they're not capable of intelligent thought. So they're not able to um, purposefully move throughout the soil, you know, um, to find these things. But in the event of a leaking sewer lateral or something like that, or you have a, uh, lots of soil moisture and high oxygen, they will exploit the resource. Thank you. I will refrain from commenting on the intelligence of trees versus maybe other life forms. <laughs> um, so if there are no other questions, shall we see if there's anyone from the public who wishes to speak? Chair McGill, no hands are raised. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so with that, I am um, prepared for any discussion or a motion. I'll make a motion. I, I did assess the tree. And it looked, it looked, I would say I would make the motion to deny without prejudice. Deny okay. mm -hmm. And that would be at 398 Wyola Road. Yep, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll second. Um, we looked at it as well, and you know the the recommendation looks pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Okay, may we have a vote, please? Chair McGill, aye. Vice Chair Clark, aye. Commissioner Aldana, aye. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton, aye. Commissioner Longstreet. Aye. Commissioner Anander LaBears. Aye. Okay, great. Thank you. So moved. We are now on the next trees. All right. Chair McGill and commissioners, the next street tree advisory committee recommendation for review is a request to remove four, four trees. Uh, that's two lemon bottle brush and two Brazilian peppers located within the front setback of the property at 1704 La Coronia Drive. The applicant listed as primary concerns for removal, you know, damage to driveway, uh, sightline concerns, and also the tree there in the front of the photograph starting to encroach just uh, out into headspace of the public sidewalk there. The committee reviewed the application, noted the trees were in fair shape. And there was consensus that the hardscape disruption was pretty significant and would require quite extensive root pruning if the driveway was to be repaired. Um, and, and in some cases, the concrete butts up right up against the base of the tree. And there was uh, <clears throat> general agreement amongst the committee members that this amount of root pruning would be detrimental um, to, to most of the trees. There was comments made <laughs> regarding the lemon bottle brush, uh, that they were fairly poorly performing, completely suppressed underneath the canopies of the pepper trees and uh, really low value specimens in terms of just beneficial trees on the property. Uh, there was discussion about the merits of retention and again, referring back to the damage caused and the amount of root pruning required to mitigate it. There was agreement amongst the members that it was a low probability of long-term survival if that path were to be taken. After review, the committee made a recommendation to approve all four removals on the condition that two new trees be planted um, either on the property or as street trees that can achieve a minimum height of 25 feet. And they made the determination during the review that the commission could make the finding that principles of good forest management will be best served by the proposed removals. Okay, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Slack? I am, oh, I see one, uh, Vice Chair Clark. I was just wondering if you had a chance to follow up with the applicant and um, how they, were they amenable with the tree replacements? Chair McGill and Commissioner Clark, we've not 
been able to connect with the applicant regarding next steps. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more raised hands, so we will go to public comment. Um, Ms. Navarez, do we have anyone from the public wishing to speak? Uh, Chair McGill, no hands are raised. Okay, great. Thank you. So with that, um, I am uh, open for comments or and or a motion on this. Uh, what well, I saw, uh, Mr. Longstreet's hand first. Who is muted? Uh, I would make a motion to concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation um, to remove the four specimens at um, 1704 La Coronilla um, and to have them replaced with two trees that reach a minimum height of 25 feet at maturity, canopy trees, um, either on site or as street trees. And this is in um, pursuant to the good forest management. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Um, Vice Chair Clark. That's a nod. Does that mean I'll second that? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm confused wow. if we're supposed to raise our hand or, or talk because we. Well, we well, the only reason for for talking is that in case there's somebody listening that can't see that your hand is raised, um, but I can see your hand is raised. <laughs> um, and all right. Um, any further discussion? I'm not seeing a raised hand, so may we have a vote, please? Chair McGill. Aye. Vice Chair Clark. Aye. Commissioner Aldana. Aye. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton. Aye. Commissioner Longstreet. Yes. Commissioner Anander Laberge. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. And this brings us to the final one on Crescent Avenue. Chair, Chair McGill and Commissioners, before we review this last item, in follow up to uh, Vice Chair Clark's question, even when we're unable to contact directly have like phone conversations with the applicant, we do make sure to forward all meeting materials in advance of the commission meeting. So they're aware of the agenda, how to participate in the meeting as well as reviewing the staff report so that they should be apprised of the, the motions. Um, so moving forward, uh, the last Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review is the request room of a TIPU uh, located within the front setback of the property at 2537 Crescent Avenue. This property was recently acquired by a new property owner and in conversations with the previous owner, uh, the previous owner explained that they had been treating this tree uh, on a quarterly basis and also pruning it regularly. Those were two maintenance concerns listed on the application for removal in addition to plans to redevelop the landscape and a desire to move away from the tipu tree and highlight the existing jacaranda that's kind of tough to tell from the photograph, but from your site visit, you were probably able to see was quite suppressed by the, the existing Tipawana, um, as well as concerns with the tree's location in relation to the home and concerns with uh, water and, and foundation damage as a result of the tree's root system. The committee reviewed the application, discussed the reasons listed on, on the application, listed by the applicant, uh, noted the tree was in great health. Um, there was some discussion about this <clears throat> mention of treatment. Um, it was There was agreement that that was probably maybe a little bit more frequent than necessary, but this tree, Tipu, does get a pest call, called Tipu psyllid that does uh, create all these little wax pellets dropping down all over your property. So um, it, it can be uh, a nuisance at times. And, and tipu itself grows pretty fast, so it does require um, pretty frequent pruning um, to keep it under control. Overall, uh, there was agreement amongst the members that the tree was in really good health, despite the maybe some of the maintenance challenges pre pre presented. Uh, there was no supportive evidence, again, in terms of actual damage to the home that would have supported uh, removal from that perspective as well. And just general comments that the tree added 
uh, considerable landscape value to Crescent Avenue, which is a street that you know is fairly devoid of trees and, and there's no parkway there, so there's no street trees. So the, the canopy cover on that street's heavily reliant upon private trees. And after review, after review made a recommendation to deny the request for the removal of, of the TIPU at 2537 Crescent Avenue. Thank you very much, Mr. Slack. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I guess I do have one. Oh, oh Commissioner Aldana. Oh, as far as the jacaranda, is that healthy and it looks like it's going to have a good life ahead of itself? Uh, Chair McGill and Commissioner Aldana, it's healthy. Um, it's uh, got a bit of an uphill battle, I think, in terms of competition with the Tipuana. Um, they could function together with a little bit of uh, pruning uh, to the Tipu's canopy. You could probably create some space and sort of encourage some vertical growth out of the jacaranda that could be beneficial. Uh, but it was in good health, but it, is, it has been suppressed over the years by the, the larger Tipu tree, certainly. So, so it didn't make any sense to remove the jacaranda and keep the... Uh, Chair McGill and Commissioner Aldana, that could make practical sense. I think in the in the long term, the applicant uh, expressed the desire to move forward with removing the tipu and and retain the jacaranda. So um, that's the 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 way that we brought the application forward. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, my question was around the jacaranda as well in terms of them coexisting, which I think you've addressed. And I guess, um, I don't know really how to ask it. I mean, from an overall diversity and desirability, is there one that is preferred over the other in the grand scheme of things? If uh, Chair McGill and Commissioners, I think those are the tipu and jacaranda are trees that have uh, similar characteristics. Jacaranda, I think, is a smaller species. When you look at the long-term potential, um, both have a very similar habit, leaf arrangement, shade. They're, they're very similar. Um, so it would be tough to say that one is necessarily more valuable than the other in, in the landscape. Okay, thanks. Um... All right, I'm not seeing any raised hands. If there aren't any further questions, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this? Chair McGill, yes, we have one hand raised. Mr. Joseph Cooper. Uh, Mr. Cooper, I will allow you to speak. You'll go ahead and unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Commissioner. I'm uh, one of the property owners and uh, the person who submitted the application. Uh, thanks for going through that, uh, Nathan. I think uh, you did a good job. Um, I'm just concerned with the the overall canopy. I mean, um, we're looking to basically kind of re-landscape just because the can canopy so large it overtakes the entire property, really, and to allow the jacaranda maybe to have a chance to be a little bit more healthy and re-landscape it. Um, I didn't put in the application to, to replant um, another tree, but that would be uh, something we would be willing to consider. Um, and uh, you were right with the disease uh, that um, the previous owner talked about it was that those wax pellets and things of that nature. And the trees kind of, I mean, it is in good health, but it's also kind of leaning over and there's quite a few branches over the uh, structure of the house itself, uh, which was also concerning to me. So. Um, that's kind of where, I, where I'm coming from, uh, not just trying to cut trees down or anything like that. I just want to make the landscaping uh, a little bit better. We are, um, uh, from the standpoint of the uh, street, um, the building is on the north side of the street, so there's not much shade that gets out into the street for uh, people that uh, walk along the street there. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, um, any comments? I mean, I guess the one thing it's, it comes for me, it just, it comes down to jacaranda versus tipu. And if it's really, I don't know, I struggle with that one because I, I love jacarandas, but ultimately it's going to be a large canopy tree as well. And it seems like there already is a large canopy tree. So it's, I'm, I'm not, 
I'm, I'm just not sure I'm seeing the benefits of trading one for the other, but um, yeah. Does anybody have a uh, vice chair Clark? I was just going to um, ask, I guess, throw a question back at you or Mr. Slack. Is it serve, is it in the best interest of the urban forest to take a, a fully mature large canopy down for a smaller tree? Are we losing biomass? Are we, you know, adding to global warming and climate change by eradicating the, the big biomass that that tree has for a smaller one? Chair McGill and Commissioner Clark, I, I think in this specific instance, it would be to go back and just see if there's a finding that supports the removal, and that really should guide the decision of the commission. Um, it's often that uh, trees are approved for removal um, with you know conditions for replacement to offset the loss in biomass. I think that you know the honest answer is if the tipu tree were gone, the jacaranda would do better. Um, it's a very small front yard or side yard, whatever you want to call it, and either tree would fill that in over time. Um, so I think you certainly would lose some biomass in the short term, but I think it, over time it would be offset. And I think it really just depends on whether there's a finding that the commission feels supports the removal of the, the tree and the setback. Uh, Commissioner Aldana. Um, would it make any sense to, to go over there and assess it one more time? You know, after hearing what the property owner wants and... Well, I would say that from my perspective, that was quite clear in the application. Um, but you can always make a motion. Uh, Commissioner R. Longstreet. Um, there hasn't been a reason that fits our criteria yet to, for removal. Um, this tree is not damaging anything. Um, we're not seeing exact potential to damage anything. Um, it benefits the urban forest. So when we go by the rules, um, I, I can't come up with a reason to remove this tree. To remove this tree to allow a much smaller tree that may take 10 to 15 years to replace it um, doesn't benefit the urban forest. Uh, the location of this tree, as close as it is to the freeway, has more benefits than, you know, if it were out in the middle of nowhere, too. I mean, there's a lot happening. So I cannot see any reason that we would go for removal. Uh, Vice Chair Clark. I'm in agreement with Commissioner Longstreet. I have the setback tree removal findings in front of me and I don't see a finding here that warrants removal of the tree. So do I hear uh, the beginnings of a motion? Yes, I am prepared to make a motion. Um, I would make a motion to agree with the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation to deny the removal of the Tipuan at Tipu at uh, Crescent Avenue. Do you have a motion? I don't. Uh, that I think was a second from Commissioner Longstreet. Yeah, she's nodding. Okay, do we have any um, further discussion? If no, may we have a vote, please? Chair McGill. Aye. Vice Chair Clark. Aye. Commissioner Aldana. Aye. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton. Aye. Commissioner Longstreet. Uh, you were saying yes, but we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, that's an aye for Commissioner Longstreet. Commissioner Unander Laberge. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that takes me out. I would like to, before we move off of this um, from the agenda, any action of the Parks and Recreation Commission made pursuant to Santa Barbara Municipal Code, Chapter 1520, Tree Planting and Maintenance, or Chapter 1524, Preservation of Trees, may be appealed to the City Council within 10 days pursuant to provisions of Section 13050 of the Municipal Code. 
All right, thank you very much. That finishes the trees and takes us to the director's report. Ms. Zachary. Chair McGill and commissioners, uh, we're heading into the busier part of the year for parks and recreation, particularly since um, we're returning to more normal operations. Um, but we did achieve a number of uh, important projects and programs during the pandemic. And one of them was the completion of the second phase of the Arroyo Borough Open Space Project. And um, that project, along with the multimodal pathway on Cliff Drive, on Modoc Road and Las Positas, was celebrated with a ribbon cutting ceremony on March 3rd. Uh, phase two of the open space project, um, which is the, the entire park area includes 21 acres. So it's both the 14 acres that the city purchased recently, plus a six acre parcel we'd originally owned, uh, plus a tiny little parcel down at the end of uh, Las Positas and Cliff Drive. Uh, we planted over 10,000 native plants including 900 trees, did some restoration of a tributary that comes down from Campanile Hill, relocated and improved the trails. And uh, I think what many people are enjoying more than anything is installed a long awaited pedestrian bridge connecting Las Vecitas to the open space, allowing people to travel on the multimodal pathway cross the bridge and actually go through the park and down Allen Road in order to get to the beach and then vice versa for the Allen Road neighbors. Uh, for individuals that enjoy going to Ealing's Park, there's now a stoplight and a crosswalk. Uh, so we've really increased pedestrian access and bicycle access throughout this area, while at, at the same time completing a very important restoration project within the Arroyo Borough watershed. It's been a long time in the making, as many projects are, uh, and it's been extremely well received by the community. Uh, Commissioner Clark mentioned the planting day that was held on the 12th. There's also been students from Laguna Blanca uh, that joined and um, did some invasive plant removal efforts. And over the course of many years, involvement from the neighbors and community in, in advising the city on how the restoration project should be implemented. Moving into, as I mentioned earlier, the busy part of uh, our recreation division, uh, summer camp registration is about to begin. It starts in early April. Our lineup is already available on our website. And as we have in the past, we are offering a wide range of camps at locations throughout the city, full time, full day, part day, counselor and training programs, and um, a variety of fun things for kids and uh, teens to do. Lifeguard, some important dates, junior lifeguard camp registration opens on Tuesday, April 5th general registration on April 6th, and then summer fun, which is our free drop-in program on Monday, April 25th. Uh, it's a flurry of activity for the recreation staff, although so much is done online. Um, it also involves a lot of interaction and communication with many families um, in order to get everything set up. And then we are also hiring staff as we always do in the summer season. And we have job postings on our website, the city uh, human resources website. So anyone interested in working for Parks and Rec for the summer, uh, please take a look at that. Uh, we like to pride ourselves in often providing one of the first jobs that someone might have as a young adult or about to be a young adult. And we're even more proud that many of them come back year after year and some of them actually land with permanent jobs either here or elsewhere um, in the community related to parks and recreation. Uh, another area that we've been really focusing on and the commission hasn't had a, a presentation about the municipal golf course in some time, so we will bring back something more thorough to you. We're in year six of our uh, management agreement with Corsco. Their agreement was renewed for another five years. 
last year. Uh, that um, agreement, um, our working with Corsco and then of course with Mulligans has gone very well uh, over the course of these six years and also specifically well during the pandemic as one of the safest sports for people to play, particularly when their ability to travel and do other things was significantly curtailed. Uh, we've been making a number of improvements on the golf course. Almost $1.2 million has been reinvested in the golf course over the last six years. The most recent project that's wrapping up or perhaps is wrapped up is the bunker uh, renewal project renovation of 11 side bunkers. Um, this is a project we've been chipping away at. I think we have two more bunkers to do that will be done in association with some greens renovation in the next few years. And um, also done as a high priority project of our golf advisory committee and members of our golfing community that have really focused on golf course improvements to improve the playability and the enjoyability of the golf course uh, throughout. And so some of the other less glamorous projects we're about to start, and you'll hear more about that in April, um, you know, a new roof in the maintenance yard and those sorts of things. So now we're beginning to turn our attention to some infrastructure needs uh, that have been unfortunately delayed for a very long time due to finances. And then uh, lastly, uh, Commissioner Aldana mentioned we had a meeting at the community garden, which is a part of Eastside Neighborhood Park on Saturday, April 12th. We also had a meeting at the Franklin Center uh, for gardeners to present and discuss options for um, how the renovation of the open part of the park can relate to the garden, location of the fence, discussion about the plot sizes, and spend some more time uh, with the gardeners as well as uh, working through opportunities to improve the garden and to do that in advance of, a, of actually going to construction for the other part of the park improvements. Um, so we are planning to retain all of the 10 by 20 plots um, and then um, work with gardeners to determine how to make improvements there. I would add that as part of the city council hearing, on the ARPA funding, a number of council members supported helping fund improvements at the community garden. And so they've allocated $100,000 toward that effort. So we'd be looking at beginning to have further discussions um, in the near future. We are um, working on uh, surveys and gathering more information before we take the next steps. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Ms. Zachary. I see um, a raised hand, Commissioner Longstreet. Yes, um, I would like to suggest that one of our first um, field trips, site visits would be to the golf course because it combines so many different aspects of parks and recreation in that, you know, the, the whole, what we've gone through with golf course management is important, but also the, the joint project with creeks about water retention and clean water, um, the youth programming that's going on out there and um, the further uh, furtherment of recreation and who's served. I think it's, um, it's really something to be proud of because it's serving from very young children, teens, seniors, just all the way up to seniors. Um, and it is a model of um, of how a golf course is, should be run nowadays, I think. Um, and I'm glad to hear that the Ananali Gardens are moving forward this way. So thank you very much for all the work on that. Yeah, yeah, I concur, concur with both points. Um, Commissioner Aldana. Uh, yes, uh, regarding the Yellanali Gardens, uh, Two questions. One, because I know that there's two volunteer folk for volunteer, for lack of a better term, you know, by the restroom. Because I I've heard that they might be chopped down, but then I've also I, I am aware of various um, people in the neighborhood that do want don't want them chopped down. Uh, at the meeting on Saturday with the gardeners, they did ask for a benches and a, pl a place to um, take a break, you know, so maybe some benches could be placed underneath the oak trees 
And then this way they got shade, they got benches, and they saved the trees. Just a suggestion. And the other, uh, the other question is the fence line. It, um, was it, um, do we know how far away from the plots they're going to be? Because I know they, they talked about um, four feet, six feet, 12 feet. Chair McGill and Commissioner Aldana, we don't have that information yet. And since we don't have a plan to share with you, we wouldn't want to speculate where everything finally lands. I think mm -hmm. what we want to do first is gather more input from a broad cross section of gardeners regarding their interests in the garden renewal. Uh, your mention of the oak trees um, is, is one that uh, has come up for discussion. And mm -hmm. it, it really, some of the opportunities, oaks are wonderful. Um, challenges are they create shade. And so it, it takes space away from gardening. Uh, we actually do have benches over there and they're not used. And so part of it is figuring out how to better allocate space while still retaining garden plots and, and bringing the standards of the garden up. It's, very overdue for a renewal and we'll work, be working closely on different concepts uh, that hopefully we'll get some consensus around. So rather than speculating, I think we want to gather more information, um, but we do know that, that if the park project moves forward in advance, the larger garden plots will, will still be in place until that second phase mm -hmm. of the project moves forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I had a question about um, the summer camp registration, and I would, and I would again encourage everybody to check out the Arroyo Borough. Maybe we can attach it to uh, the golf course trip, um, <laughs> um, picnic in Arroyo Borough. Um, the summer fun program. I know we have struggled with during the pandemic to get it up to full speed, and part of the issue, as you came up in this past summer, was was actually staffing and fun. It was staff concerns. Do you think you're going to be able to get anything like full numbers of participants this summer or still struggling? Chair McGill and commissioners, we're working on a variety of strategies uh, to secure adequate summer staff as well as hourly staff that are important to the implementation of both our recreation programs as well as our park operations. Um, some of the steps that we've taken in the course of this year is actually uh, raised hourly salaries, and that's often a good way to attract um, new employees. And then we're also working with our human resources department to take forward recommendations to update and improve our hourly uh, salary schedule so that when uh, new staff come on board, they have a, a higher hourly salary than they had previously. As, as one might imagine, the challenge with that is the money has to come from somewhere to pay for those salaries. So we balance revenue versus expense. That said, um, it's our intent to continue the summer fund program because it's so successful at no cost. There's a small registration fee, which um, is helpful to ensure people are serious about having their children in the program but to retain that as a subsidized program, while we also offer um, other programs that require fees. And at the same time, if I could just tag on to that, whenever we can um, uh, work on increasing the number of scholarships that are provided for the fee-based summer program. So it's a three-prong approach, along with uh, putting forward recommendations to actually raise, raise those salaries and attract um, more more folks to our jobs. Yeah, thanks. I mean, my my focus on summer fun is is just you know exactly because it's subsidized and it and it provides such a vital service to the community. Um, so, Chair McGill and Commissioners, that, yeah. we would love to secure more grant funding. We are extremely grateful to the Wood Clayson's Foundation for funding that program year in and year out. Um, it's pretty much represents less than 10% of the total cost of the program. So you will hear more at the budget presentation next month about um, the priority that we place on that as well as our other uh, no cost 
and lower cost programs so that all as many people and youth in Santa Barbara can participate in parks and recreation. Great, thanks, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Longstreet. Echo what you're saying, and I think it's especially important coming out of the pandemic that, these, that the children of our community have a place to play. The children whose families are maybe have suffered the most through the pandemic don't have the resources. And I'm so happy to hear it's back up and running. Um, I think it's what what we do for the community. It's it's how we care for our children. And there's nothing, really nothing more important than that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Agree, totally. All right, I'm not seeing any more raised hands. Thank you. It's, um, it's really exciting to be going into the summer season and um, look forward to hearing how successful it is. Um, with that, we have the next agenda item, which is um, Plaza Vera Cruz license agreement. And I see Mr. Hanna. Yes, good afternoon, Chair McGill and Commissioners. Rich Hanna, Recreation Manager. I'm here to provide you with an information report on the Plaza Vera Cruz license agreement uh, request for proposal process. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna walk you through a presentation. We'll talk a little bit about the background specifically of Plaza Veracruz. We'll talk about the pilot program that we launched um, last summer in May. Uh, I'll take you through the request for proposal process that we initiated. And then I'll talk a little bit about the agreement, the proposed agreement with Santa Barbara Trapeze Company. Uh, I'll talk, answer any questions and speak to budget and financial information, and then I'll be available for questions at the end. Next slide, please. So just, I think we're all familiar with Plaza Veracruz, but I just wanted to you know, go over some of the highlights. It's a 1.5 acre park in downtown Santa Barbara. It was designated a public park in 1855. So it's one of the oldest parks in the city. Uh, it has a history of chronic misuse behaviors, unsafe park conditions, and, and to be honest, just illegal activity. Um, many people in this community have different names for Plaza Veracruz that don't really speak to the value of this asset within inside Santa Barbara. Uh, recently, the park, the Parks and Recreation Department took on improvements at the park, which included removal of the playground. Um, we installed temporary perimeter fencing. We did turf expansion and improvement, and we conducted landscape upgrades at the same time. Next slide, please. So following the park improvements, one of the goals the department has was to explore positive recreational opportunities at this location and a better management strategy to deter misuse. Um, we partnered with Santa Barbara Trapeze Company as a pilot program with a goal of providing that positive recreational element. And it was for both youth and adult trapeze classes and summer camps. Um, we brought this to the commission in April of 2021. Uh, it was unanimously supported in terms of implementing this pilot program uh, and it's been successfully supported and welcomed by surrounding residents and businesses, whether that was at the community meeting we also hosted in April of 2021 or just ongoing comments and feedback that uh, staff receive when they're on site or just communications that we receive from the public. I think most importantly, and, I, and I'd want to add this in there is this program, I think, further illustrates the, the benefit of activating a park to deter misuse behaviors. And, and we, as a department, continue to try to do that at several of our park locations where we have those types of activities occurring. Next slide, please. So just a couple of um, quotes that we received. Um, this is from an area resident, and I think this really speaks to kind of the condition of the park, the experiences a resident had prior to the pilot program going in, and then really their, their thankfulness for what the park and how the park currently operates today in terms of resolving some of those difficult situations. Um, and I, I'm happy to read this uh, for people at home that are just listening. Uh, I cannot say enough about how elated I am that the trapeze operation moved into Plaza Veracruz. Until the operation started, we had nothing but vagrancy, noise, and disruption to my tenants and to me. I honestly do not know what I would have done if you had not come in to save me from the situation I was dealing with. Next slide, please. And then to balance that, you know, this is a this is a neighboring business. It's actually Cata that's immediately next door to 
uh, Plaza Veracruz, and and in their comments, they're really talking about you know the the benefit to the neighborhood, the positive effects, the the increase in foot traffic, and just just some general excitement in the area. And their quote is, "I'm a big fan of what the park at Plaza Veracruz has evolved to in, into over the past years. The neighborhood has definitely seen a more desirable population of foot traffic." Having the Santa Barbara Trapeze Company next to our facility has sparked interest in clients who frequent the center and has also sparked new life into our little section of Haley Street. I'd love to see what continues to grow as a result of having Santa Barbara Trapeze Company next door. Next slide, please. So some of the pilot program outcomes. Um, the, this summer, the camp actually served 279, 279 youth I would add that the partnership with this pilot program started late. So you just heard Ms. Uh, Director Zachary talk about we're launching summer camp initiatives in early April and registration. We didn't even launch this program until May. So it missed a lot of our initial outgoing marketing campaigns. It was not included in the Santa Barbara Independent or summer camp listings. It was really a, a big effort post those uh, marketing campaigns to get some activity there both a partnership between the department and Santa Barbara Trapeze Company. So serving close to 300 participants in their first year is extremely successful. Um, we have a contractual split agreement with the Trapeze Company. And so the department received just under $10,000 in net revenue. Um, they provided 15 scholarships. And in their first year, they had a floating scale where they were willing to provide one scholarship for every five participants they had. So. We didn't have a locked in amount of scholarships that we felt like we could award. So they were very flexible with us to make sure we could provide that. And, th and that has close to a value of uh, $6,000. Outside of the summer camp programming, they do provide ongoing youth and adult trapeze classes. And so they've served an additional 700 participants through that. Um, they've also contracted landscape maintenance um, for the entire park which has allowed our parks crew to redirect their resources to other city parks. And, and I think our expectation is you'll see more attention to those parks. So they took on the cost of that at almost uh, just under $18,000, which uh, ensures the park is maintained to the, the department, department standards. Um, and again, allows us to reallocate resources. And then I think something that, that could be um, misinterpreted is during their operating hours, they, they were extremely welcoming. I think they really ingrained themselves in the community there in the neighborhood. If they were open and people wanted to come in and spectate and have lunch in the park and watch the trapeze activities, they were welcome to do that. Um, there were instances of other people coming into the park and, and coming through the entry area and then walking their dog in the back portion of the park. Um, they really tried to be welcoming and a good community partner through this whole process. Uh, next slide, please. So from our summer camp program, just a couple of uh, testimonials. Um, this camp was one of the best of the summer in terms of the environment the team created. It felt so emotionally healthy and supportive. My daughter wants to sign up for more trapeze camp weeks next summer. Way to go, SB Parks and Rec, great acquisition. And then another one, just most exciting camp ever. Staff were so professional and welcoming. This is an A++ camp. Uh, I, would, I would note that in the submittal that we received from Santa Barbara Trapeze Company, we actually, they submitted 23 um, letters or notes of support speaking to uh, their outcome at the park or what the department has brought to this park. Um, eight of those were from adjacent neighbors and residences and businesses and 15 were for non-camp participants that are made up of people of all ages, but really spoke to either the positive experiences with the instruction, the professionalism of the Santa Barbara Trapeze Company staff and their operation, and just when they were using the park in general. Next slide, please. So a common process for the city to go through when we're looking at um, partnering with somebody to deliver programs and services is uh, we did a, a request for proposal. So we, before we did that, we evaluated the benefits of licensing a portion of the park. Um, we, we looked at the current trapeze operation and we thought that to accommodate something of that size or any other activity that may be interested in using the park, we felt that 60% of the park could be used as a licensed area. Um, and that would leave 40% of the park available for uh, public use, which I'll speak to later. 
Um, we initiated a re request for proposal to seek successful licensees for structured year round recreational activities. We wanted to make sure we had activity in the park year round. I think a that that really gets back to keeping the misuse behavior out of the park. It keeps the park activated and the neighborhood activated um, and also provides uh, additional eyes and a management strategy for both the licensed part of the park and what is going to be the public part of the park. Some of the requirements that we seek in an RFP, and, and this is not uncommon with other RFPs, is we're looking at their operating method methodology, what their business plan is, what the revenue share would be for the department, um, both contractually, but also uh, in terms of scholarships. And then we're looking at qualifications and experience with a goal of ultimately seeking out the, the, the highest and most professional operation we can bring in that also generates essentially the most amount of money to the city and is it compatible with other things that the Parks and Recreation Department provides. Next slide, please. Uh, so the request for proposal process, we released the RFP in December of last year. Um, the city posts that on Planet Bids, and so it, it's something that's not only open to this community, but uh, anybody that's a registered subscriber, it goes into different criterias. Um, so the people that that uh, provide these types of business opportunities, this is a place that they look. Um, we also used various social media platforms, whether that was department, next door, um, just really trying to drive up some interest in um, people uh, either asking questions about this or looking to potentially bring a proposal forward. Um, we also looked at um, contacting current and past service providers. Um, we work with a number of service providers um, over, our, over at least my career, but um, we reached out to them directly. They received the direct link to Planet Bids, um, and then they have the opportunity to participate. We uh, hosted a non-mandatory pre-proposal meeting uh, on January 5th, and that that's really just for people to come and ask questions, and then whatever questions we get asked, we then post to Planet Bids. So it was non-mandatory, so everybody gets to hear um, what was asked of staff and what staff responded so that the, the process is transparent. Um, we had a total of two participants. One was Santa Barbara Trapeze Company, uh, and the other company, um, well, the other interested party uh, is a local dog agility group that's really looking to uh, host a uh, local dog competition in the area, and we're exploring Plaza Veracruz. I, I'm happy to report that we've been able to work with them through the special event process that we do, and we're actually looking to host that first um, dog agility contest at Pershing Park. And I'm not sure of the date at this time, but uh, they they were not interested in the overall operation and management at the park, but we were able to use that opportunity to, to accommodate uh, something that I think will be a, a unique uh, special event in this community. Uh, the RFP closed on January 19th, so we were open almost six weeks, which is usually about two weeks longer than you would normally have an RFP open for. And we received one proposal that met all of the required objectives. And that was the Santa Barbara Trapeze Company. Next slide, please. So before I talk about the proposed agreement with Santa Barbara Trapeze Company, I, I just wanted to talk briefly about the department has a long history of partnering with third party agencies to deliver programs and services, things that that we don't, uh, we're not staffed to do, we're not expert in. We do that through a number of different methods, whether that's co-sponsorship agreements, lease agreements, license agreements. Um, and, and really it's a way of us expanding our deliverable programs and services to the community. Some of these uh, activities or services that we partner with receive exclusive use of a facility or a portion of a facility for exclusive use. And some of those just so, because this process is no different than anything else we do. The Santa Barbara Swim Club, for example, has exclusive use of Los Banos pool on weekdays and sometime on weekends from 2.30 to 6 p.m. So 360 days of the year, Santa Barbara Swim Club has exclusive use of Los Banos pool for their programming through a license agreement, which means the public cannot come in and use it. We also provide exclusive use to our summer camp providers. So our beach volleyball courts and tennis courts for 10 weeks of the summer on weekdays are unavailable to the public from 9 a.m. to noon so that we can deliver these critical summer programs when parents are looking for activities when school is not in session. We have beach concessionaires that deliver 
at East and West Beach that provide beach chairs and umbrellas and uh, stand up paddle boards and other beach related equipment. Their space is considered exclusive. Um, that helps with other vending services that may try to enter the beach and provide those services, but gives them a, a place to operate a business. And then also our community center leases. Um, you know, we dedicate interior spaces um, to provide health and legal and social services. And those are provided year round in, in both the West Side and the Franklin Community Service. And the point of all of that is this, this type of agreement is not uncommon with what we do to expand our programs and services in the community and the use of our city parks and recreation facilities. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, hold on, sorry. Uh, so the proposed agreement with Santa Barbara Trapeze Company, um, we're looking into entering into this agreement where they'll go on, continue to conduct year round structured activities um, that would include trapeze classes for all ages. They would continue to do their youth summer camps. Um, they will provide pro private and public events and performances. They've already done several performances at that location and they're looking to uh, increase those, um, but still be compatible with the neighborhood where people can come in and experience, you know, that circus trapeze type atmosphere. Uh, and then also they'd have the ability to do concession sales on site, which is really just their t-shirts and things that support their operation, but not compete with any adjacent businesses. Next slide, please. The proposed agreement with San Rafael Trapeze Company uh, also includes that they're responsible for keeping the area clean and in a safe condition. Uh, at the conclusion of their agreement, whenever that it does expire, they're required to return the site to an acceptable level. Uh, we felt that that's important um, for any new uh, entity that was looking to propose uh, a business plan for this site. If they'd come in and talked about removing turf and, and making structural changes to the location, we wanted to make sure that it would return back to a park at the conclusion of that agreement. Um, they will continue to provide ongoing public access to the license area during the operating hours. And as I mentioned earlier, the remaining 40% of the park, um, which is back towards the first start building, which is on uh, Coda Street, um, that part of the park, we're looking to reopen to the public in early April. And we're looking at a, an opening time of that part of the park from 8 a.m. to 5.30 on a daily schedule. So that, that will allow people that, that need to use the park, or would like to use the park for unstructured activities or at times when the trapeze company is not in operation, um, predominantly during the school year and early hours of the morning to have access to the park. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the budget and financial information, um, the, the agreement is a one-year term. Um, it has extensions, so it can be a maximum of four years total, and, and that's based on their continuing to meet the performance objectives that were outlined in the RFP. Um, so that includes the things that I just talked about and then also just their operating model in terms of professionalism and staffing. Um, so it is a one-year agreement with up to four years total extension. Um, the city's net revenue that they will receive per year is $24,000. So that's our summer camp revenue that we would receive through the revenue share. Um, they've committed to summer scholarship funding. So last, it, when I talked about the pilot program, it was a, it was a floating scale. Um, the value of those scholarships is $35,000. Um, we're looking at 40 summer camp scholarships. So that's four per session for 10 weeks. Uh, and then year-round uh, youth class scholarships for their master classes, they're looking at providing 25 of those. And again, this is to, to bring people to this park and have this experience through a scholarship rather than just the department receiving revenue. It has a net benefit to the community. Um, they've agreed to the license to maintain the license area, which includes fencing. Um, they're also going to be paying for water for the park. Um, so they'll take on the water costs. So ongoing maintenance, water costs for the park that has a value of $30,000. So the, the total estimated compensation when you look at what the department will receive in rent revenue, what they're contributing to people participating in the activity, and then the deferral of costs that we would typically incur is a total estimated compensation of uh, just under $90,000. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Um... 
Does anybody have any questions? I am not seeing a raised hand. So what I, oh wait, uh, Mr. Aldana. Uh, for the city, it looks like a win-win, yeah. So uh, right now I, I'm in favor of it and uh, hopefully it, it'll be a success. And it looks like it will be. So it was a good, good presentation and and it looks like a good plan. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Anander Laberge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does this set in any way a precedent? You had mentioned several other uh, locations around town where there are private vendors um, leasing you know, city space and they have their own businesses operating. By closing off the park by 60% of the park in this way, which those other vendors that you mentioned, they're not closing off the beach access. They're not making you know certain exclusive, um, maybe with the exception of the pool. Um, but is this setting a precedent? You know, what what if, for example, we wanted to have a dog club come in that was going to teach dog agility and and other training, and they wanted to use you know one of the parks that's kind of set up that way. Um, you know, I love dogs, so I'm not opposed to that, but is this in some way setting a precedent that we want to be careful about? Thank you. Uh, Chair McGill and Commissioner Anander Labarge. Um, so we, we evaluate all of these types of program proposals um, carefully, and we make sure that there's a, there's a benefit to the community and it's something that can be managed ongoing. You are correct when you refer to some of the other uh, private concessions that I referenced. It doesn't mean that outside of those hours, those areas are not open to the public, but the, the pool is a good example of when it isn't available to the public, uh, even though it's a public asset. We, we currently permit a dog agility class up at McKenzie Park. And so we, we have other ways to bring activities into our park. Um, but when we look at a model like this, we're very conscientious. This is something we do not want to expand without making sure we evaluate all of the, the pros and cons, which is why we, you know, we looked at the typical history of the misuse. We hosted the community meeting, you know, and if we'd heard at that time that there were overarching concerns, we, we would have probably pumped the brakes and then stepped back and reevaluated. Um, this type of activity is unique. We don't get a lot of these requests. Um, this is the first one. I this is the first time I've ever brought trapeze to the department or the city in my 29 years. But in most cases, we do it through a co-sponsorship or some sort of other agreement. So, it's it's a valid point. We are aware of that, but it's I don't think we're setting a precedent because we do do it in other situations. Thank you. Um, anything else? So I think I'm gonna. Just take pause now and see if there's anyone from the public that is queued up to um, comment on this particular agenda item. Uh, Chair McGill, I have two hands raised, no, three now. Uh, the first person will be Mr. Paul Bowen. Um, so I will unmute you and you will unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, I'm one of those active adult participants and the Santa Barbara Trapeze Company has been very welcoming to the public that's always cruising by and wanting to watch people do trapeze. Uh, the neighbor I talked to really loved it. It seems to be a fantastic program for the Santa Barbara youth. The kids love it. So this truly is, a, I think, a win-win for the city of Santa Barbara. Uh, you know, when you make the... Uh, the route for the uh, various tour buses that come around so they can come see the people do trapeze. It's, it's quite impressive. So it's, it's just a really good organization. It's helping out youth. It's allowing people to come into the park and see something really amazing and fun. So uh, all in favor of it. I think it's a wonderful thing for Santa Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Okay, our next speaker is Marissa Justina. Ms. Justina, you will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Uh, so I am a resident around the corner. I'm, I work as an engineer at a company in town and I moved here for work about five years ago. I now live around the corner from the Veracruz Park. 
Um, I actually started looking for a place to live in January of 2020, and I wasn't familiar with that area. I saw the park on the map and I got really excited. Um, and then when I came and visited the, the park, I immediately discovered that I wasn't going to be able to use it or even really feel safe walking through the park because in the beginning of 2020, the appearance of the misuse and illegal activity that was mentioned before was pretty intimidating to me. Um, I moved to the area anyway with some optimism that I would find times where I felt. We have lost her. Can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Okay. Yep. Um, so when I moved, when I when I did move to the area, again, this was in, in 2020, the park had been completely blocked off. There was no access to it. All the grass was dead. Um, I actually was just looking through my phone. I have some photos from walking by the park and just seeing this sad, dead, barren space. Um, and then the arrival of SBTC, which happened in May of 2021, really brought a radical metam metamorphosis. I, I experienced that park change to become a community space unlike anything I've experienced anywhere else in this town. Um, like there, there are still times of day and streets that are close to my home where I don't feel safe walking at certain times. But since the arrival of the Santa Barbara Trapeze Company, I feel safer in the area and I feel safe in the park. Um, I, I bring neighbor, friends and neighbors and visitors to the park. I'm, I run into friends and neighbors and visitors in the park. Um, and I'll, I'll sometimes talk with former neighbors about going to the park and they're surprised I walk over there. Um, I can attest to some of the names that Rich Hanna referred to at the beginning that don't really speak to the park's potential, but the park has wildly exceeded my expectations and that's really due to the presence of the trapeze company. So I'm also all in favor. Thanks. Thank you. That's um, quite a testimonial. Okay, our next speaker is Amber Budner. Thank you. I, sorry. Hi, thanks so go. much. Um, my name is Amber Budden. I am a Santa Barbara resident for the last 15 years, and I have two children that were born and are being raised here. And I also wanted to voice my support for Santa Barbara Trapeze at Plaza Veracruz. Um, we're regular users of parks and rec programs um, and also of outdoor space in town. And prior to Santa Barbara Trapeze, we only visited Plaza Veracruz a couple of times for very specific events, um, favoring other locations for recreation. Trapeze has brought us to the park on a regular basis. Um, both myself and my daughter um, fly there frequently. And given its accessible location, we typically bike or we walk down to the park. And so we spend a lot of additional time in the area frequenting other businesses. And as was mentioned um, by Rich Hanna, I feel that it's not just the customers of the business that are benefiting from the location. Um, the team are incredibly welcoming and a lot of people come to enjoy the park and watch classes um, when they're walking by or they're on their way to dinner or drinks in the funk zone. Um, Santa Barbara Trapeze is really helping to cultivate a sense of community at the park. Um, I think this is reflected in their free community events, in the shows that they're running, and in the children's summer camps, and they add a vibrancy to the area that really didn't exist previously. So I fully support um, the, the Trapeze Company being at the park. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any additional speakers, Ms. Navarez? Chair McGill, no other hands are raised. Okay, great, thank you very much. Well, I for one never thought even in a relatively limited time here that I would hear the day that tour buses were going by specifically to look at Plaza Veracruz. So that's uh, quite exceptional. <laughs> um, and I see Commissioner Longstreet first and then Vice Chair Clark. Um, I attended the, the first meeting to preview the program in the park and heard from the neighbors then about all the issues and all of us who've lived here know the issues in the park. Um, I think this was a very unique situation for us. Uh, it was a park that no matter what in this, there was many joint efforts with PD and all to get get that park cleaned up and there was just it wasn't happening and it wasn't for a lack of trying so I am so glad to see this area returned for positive use to the public uh, 
one of my greatest concerns was having the preschool up at the other end and with the activities that were in the park. And now those, those children get to see positive activities happening nearby. Um, so I am very supportive of it. Do I think we are going to be doing this in all our parks? No, I do not. I, um, I think we're, we have a good model, but I will say over the years, I have watched us go from a large recreation staff that provided most of our camp pro, um, camps to the, the model we have now, which is, you know, Lego camp is brought in, soccer camp is brought in. There are different um, companies that run their programs in a way that possibly we can't anymore um, to the same standards and and just with the current budget situation is quite frankly the big problem for us. So I think the model that we see of having um, this kind of camp and activity uh, contracted out is the future. It's more to me, um, probably not the exclusive use of a park. This equipment requires it and serves a purpose in this neighborhood to make it a safer place. So um, I think it's always good to see something new work. And um, I don't think we should be afraid to try this in the future. And in, in a sense, it's kind of no different than our what we talked about earlier with community gardens. I mean, I don't go hang out in the community gardens because I don't have a garden. It's pretty much for the exclusive use of the gardeners and they're fenced off. So maybe it is, we do have different precedents for it. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Clark. Yeah, I, I echo what Commissioner Longstreet said. We shouldn't be afraid to embrace something new like this. And in my time as a commissioner, um, I've, we've heard more and more about repurposing parks and trying to invite in active recreation to, to keep those parks out of trouble. And it's reminding me of parenting. It's like just with a kid that's bored, it's going to get into trouble. But if you can you know, approach these parks like troubled kids and, and keep them busy and keep them active, they're going to be much safer all around. So kudos to the department for, for starting that years ago and continuing to do it to, to put this active recreation in our parks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I won't um, belabor it by, but certainly agree with everything that um, Commissioner Longstreet and Vice Chair Clark said. It's a real, it's, it's a role model and it's, it's horses for courses. It's not for every place and everyone, but it's, it's, it's what has really, really worked here and we should, you know, celebrate it. And, and thank everybody involved. Uh, Nicole. Did you raise your hand again? When we're done with this discussion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, which I think we are. Yep. <laughs> right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Hanna. It was a very great job. Um, that takes us to old business. I don't think we have any. No, and any new business? I don't think we have any. We have already made the announcement about the next meeting being actually in person. Um, Ms. Zachary, Director Zachary, I believe that the next meeting is our annual budget discussion. Am I correct? Chair McGill and commissioners, yes, we will be bringing forward the proposed budget for fiscal year 23 to the commission. It will include the general fund operating budget, the Creeks fund operating budget, and the Gulf fund operating budget. We will also be providing the commission with the recommendations for the capital projects for fiscal year 23 and providing a report on the status of projects that are currently underway. This will be a meeting of the commission where we will be asking the commission to make a recommendation to the city council regarding our proposed budget and the council hearing will be on May 9th. I would also add that we also provide to the commission an outline of our fees and charges and our performance measures that are associated with the next year's fiscal budget. 
Thank you. Um, I, I raised it and asked the question just for our new commissioners, just to give you a bit of a heads up that you will be um, surprised at the size of your packet and you will probably want to a lot perhaps a little bit more time than you might normally think you need for preparation and actually meeting attendance. Um, this is a, this will be a meaty meeting and it's an important meeting. Um, and then before I adjourn, Vice Chair Clark, you had your hand raised. I just wanted to put in one last plug for our Chef Apprentice Programs graduation dinner on Saturday, April 2nd. Um, I believe the public can attend if they wanted to buy a fundraising ticket for that. And they can call Anita Ho at 805-451-2928 um, or probably the Parks Department if they wanted information on how to buy that ticket to support our youth. And it's a lot of fun and you'll get a decent dinner. Well, you get a good dinner. You won't get a decent dinner. You'll get a good dinner and you'll get a lot of choice. <laughs> And, and Chair McGill and Commissioners, I would say that this is the return of the Youth Culinary Arts Program having been on hiatus as a result of the pandemic. So kudos to the staff and then also Jolly Brothers um, that uh, host and make it happen. And then of course the youth and their families that have engaged in this program. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great fun. Yeah, all right. If there are no other announcements, I will, uh, oh, well, uh, Commissioner Aldana. Yeah, so once again, the, the deadline for the RSVPs on this, on the Chef Apprentice graduation. So Chair McGill and Commissioner Aldana, it actually has passed. So a recommendation would be uh, the email address um, and you received an email from us a number of weeks ago, as well as a paper invitation in the mail that you email and just double check that there's still space available. Mm -hmm. um, and then checks are made payable to the Park Foundation uh, since the culinary arts program is under the umbrella of the Park Foundation. Got it. And being that next month we're going to be, it's going to be a nice thick packet. Is it possible to get the list of the trees a little sooner, you know, that, that we have to go look at that could possibly be cut or not cut, you know. Chair, Chair McGill and Commissioner Aldana, we can send the commission the link to the Street Tree Advisory Committee agenda, and you can see the trees that will be considered in those applications, what you would not have is the recommendations of the Street Tree Advisory Committee. So the Street Tree Advisory Committee meets on the first Thursday of every month. They make their recommendations and then the staff prepare the memorandum that you receive as well as the attachments based on the outcome of that meeting. So you could um, see which ones are being considered, but it, we would not be able to share the recommendations unless you attended the meeting until we actually um, issue the commission agenda, which is to the best of our ability uh, on the Thursday prior to the meeting, which is more than the 72 hour advance notice that's required under the Brown Act. Okay, okay. So if that's helpful, we would be we would be happy to, to do that. And you can yeah, also Yes, it is. Thank you. Sure. All right. And I now am truly not seeing any more raised hands. So with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. See you next month in person. <laughs>